and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armelian. In this hour, the rights of people with disabilities is a growing and important area of human rights. But what exactly does it mean to ensure equal treatment under the law? What exactly is a disability and who makes the judgment? What do we mean by ableism? Doug Becker explores these issues and more. I'm Doug Becker. In 1990, the U.S. Congress passed a landmark piece of legislation, the Americans with Disabilities Act. This recognized persons with disabilities as what legally is referred to as a protected class, deserving of equal treatment under the law without discrimination based on their disability. But this just began the conversation about what constitutes equal treatment and disability. Disability rights are essential human rights. And it's recognized by the UN under a treaty, the 2006 Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. What is the state of the discourse on ensuring the equality and civil rights of persons with disabilities? What legal, social, and economic challenges does the disabilities community face? What does ableism mean? And what do we mean about disability rights and disability justice? On today's show, we're going to discuss these and many other essential issues. Our panel is Lydia X. Z. Brown. They are part of the core faculty in the Disability Studies program at Georgetown University, as well as in the Critical Race and Gender Studies program at American University. Lydia is the co-editor of All the Weight of Our Dreams on Living Racialized Autism and the author of Ableist Shame and Disruptive Bodies, survivorship at the intersection of queer, trans, and disabled existence. Michael Ashley Stein is the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He's the editor of Mental Health, Legal Capacity, and Human Rights. And Joel Michael Reynolds, a senior advisor to the Hastings Center and Assistant Professor of Philosophy and Disability Studies at Georgetown University. He's the co-author of The Harm of Ableism, Medical Error and Epistemic Injustice, and the author of Three Things Clinicians Should Know About Disability. And a special acknowledgement for our producer, Melissa Chiprin, who produced today's show. She is disabled and has been educating me on these important issues for a number of years, and in particular, in preparation for today's show. Thank you all very much for joining us. Lydia, let's start with you. There's this concept called ableism. Could you explain what ableism is and what the challenge of ableism is for the disability community? Most people would define ableism as being prejudice, discrimination, bias, or bigotry against disabled people. I define ableism differently. Ableism is systemic, structural, and institutional oppression. What that means is that it's a system of power differentials and power relations, wherein some people's bodies and minds are valued and deemed as normal, as healthy, as well, as whole, functional, sane, stable, strong, intelligent, and beautiful. And that denomination of certain people as normal and healthy and all those other things comes at the direct expense of those people whose bodies and minds are instead deemed to be defective, broken, weak, disordered, deviant, unstable, crazy, dumb, or ugly. Ableism as a system of oppression of power relations means that for those considered normal or well, they are granted enormous political, social, cultural, and economic power, and it comes at the expense of those who are deemed as broken, those who are deemed as wrong. It is a system of values and beliefs, in other words, that affects and pervades every part of our lives today, every part of society. It affects our interpersonal interactions. It affects our relationships with one another, with our own bodies and minds, our perceptions of our own body, mind, and capacity, what we think of as a desirable future, what we think of as the problems in our current day and age. And it affects us systematically and in a, in a meta sense. It affects and pervades our laws 
our social, legal, and economic institutions. It affects the ways in which society is shaped to meet the needs of some people while depriving others of the most basic needs and the most basic resources. Ableism also can never be disentangled from or understood separately from its historical and contemporary context as deeply intertwined with, necessary for, and dependent on other forms of oppression, domination, and subjugation. Ableism is deeply tied to our notions about race, about class, about gender, and even about nation. The ideas of which types of people count as fully human or even as persons to begin with, our ideas about what it means to achieve personhood, about what kinds of people need to be forcibly assimilated or need to approximate desirable or advantaged characteristics, and about what it means societally for us to conceptualize a desirable gender, a desirable body, a desirable nation. And so to understand ableism requires us to understand disability and it requires us to understand that disability is, has never been a concept, an identity, or an experience that has ever existed in isolation. Michael Stein, these challenges of sort of the, the framing of ableism certainly have manifested themselves in legal ways. And I started off talking about a piece of legislation and a treaty that was meant to at least, you know, to legally try to address some of these concerns. How effective have some of these legal campaigns been at trying to recognize the rights of persons with disabilities? Well, Doug, you know, there's a difference between the politics and the acts of recognition and between the real life experiences of people with disabilities of whom there are over 1 billion of us on this planet. We still as a group, as a population, remain vastly underemployed, under economically empowered, under socially included, um, and are subject to lots of regimes of forced exclusion, segregation, etc. Having said that, um, to take your question in two parts, began your, your introduction with the Americans with Disabilities Act 1990. And for those of us who are older and remember life before the ADA, life in this country has dramatically improved as far as the day-to-day -day existence, recognition that we have rights, even if people at times resist them. The idea that people with disabilities can go everywhere, belong everywhere, should be recognized everywhere. But we have a long way to go in this country because the politics of recognition and of accommodation you know, we have to do it for you. You're a bit of a pain, but, you know, we're under a legal obligation. We're going to do it. Are very different from the politics and the dynamics of inclusion, belonging, and valuing. And we see that across the board, you know, whether it has to do with the low number of people with disabilities employed, the low number, and since we're all teachers here, faculty, what happened to the Rehabilitation Act's affirmative action mandate of not discriminating against people with disabilities. I mean, where are the faculty members? Where are the staff? Where are the students with disabilities in large numbers? But we've seen dramatic improvements. We're talking on the international realm, and I was privileged to have been one of the people to have participated in the negotiations of that human rights treaty and have worked in 44 countries implementing it. We're seeing dramatic improvements on the formal level, as in you know, 30 something countries revising their mental health laws, otherwise frequently referred to literally as lunacy acts and other retrogressive harmful language. Um, we see the whole UN system coming around to including people with disabilities, having focal points of people, disabilities, programming changing regarding people with disabilities. And we see the big elephant in the room, which is the World Bank with its $180 billion a year of loans pivoting towards including disability as one of the human rights which have safeguard protections. So things have gotten better and things are both formally getting better, but when we speak to our friends and colleagues on the ground, many, if not most, are still suffering. Many, if not most, are still grappling with access to healthcare. COVID certainly made that very clear. Many, if not most, are still grappling with employment and other things. So the progress is incremental. Having said that, it's you know 30 years since the ADA, um, and I could say my life has dramatically improved as a person with a disability in this country. 
And I hope and pray and work all the time to hope to be able to say the same about our friends outside this country. Thank you. Jill Reynolds, this question about disability sort of broadly as a unique challenge in areas of healthcare about what constitutes a disability and what are the ways in which people trained to provide healthcare address these questions of disability. What are some of the particularly striking challenges? That's a great question. Uh, Thank you for that. I also just want to say thanks for the invitation to be on here. I'm so glad this conversation is happening. And also it's a real honor to speak next to Lydia and Michael, whose work I've followed for years and and I'm a a huge fan of all that they've done uh, practically, theoretically and everything. Um, Regarding that question, you know, uh, I loved the definition that Lydia gave of ableism. And I think the kind of lay of the land that Michael gave is so useful to think about disability the law and representation globally and naturally. When it comes to healthcare, there are some very specific hurdles that have been recognized by disability activists and scholars for decades, but we're still not making very much progress. And here's what I mean. Take a recent study came out in Health Affairs just this last February by Lisa Iazzoni, a Harvard MD and, and a team. This is one of the larger surveys of this sort. It was 714 practicing physicians in the United States. And they asked a number of questions, and I would highly recommend readers who are interested in this stuff to go take a look at the whole piece. But there are two crucial findings that came out of this that I think exemplify the sort of problems that we need to address more directly in the healthcare system. Here's the first finding. Over 40% of those physicians admitted that they do not think they are equipped properly to provide equal care to patients with severe disability. They just openly admitted they're not sure they can do that. Another 80%, over 80%, reported that they think people with severe disabilities have a lower quality of life than those without severe disabilities and those who are non-disabled. Now, that second finding is especially distressing because we have decades upon decades of social scientific work showing that to be false. (laughs) People with severe disability, as with those with non-severe disability, have about the same quality of life. In some populations, it actually seems to be a bit higher than their quote-unquote able-bodied counterparts. And the fact that you could have this high of a percentage of physicians suggesting that this is true, that this is just the state of affairs regarding the links between quality of life and disability, this really worries me. You know, this shows problems at multiple levels. Something is clearly going wrong with medical education. Something perhaps is also going wrong with continuing medical education and the larger kind of uh, social cultural milieu of health environments and how people think about what it means to live with severe disability. And if we look to disability studies, you know, we now have a rich body of research way over 50 years old. If we look to disability activism of over the last 60, 70 years, We can see that a lot of the quality of life issues that people with disabilities face, it's about their environment. It's about the built world. It's about stairs being somewhere instead of ramps or stigmatization or all of this stuff that we can change. It's not about often, not always, (laughs) it's typically often not about their body intrinsically automatically making things worse. And so that has to be fixed in our healthcare system at the level of individual practitioner judgments, but also about how we think about disability in larger healthcare systems, the way healthcare is delivered, public health, you name it. If you listen to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org, we're discussing issues of disability rights, the challenge of ableism and equal treatment with our guests, Lydia Brown of Georgetown University and American University, Michael Stein of Harvard Law School, and Joel Michael Reynolds of Georgetown University. And um, Lydia Brown, what Joel just said kind of struck me, at least in part, the way in which the medical community assuredly must think of issues of disabilities and that disabilities is something that needs to be fixed. Is it fair to say that that's one of the really great challenges that ableism poses is the notion that people with disability are people that need to be fixed? So ableism teaches us that disability is pathology, that disability is necessarily suffering, which is a point that Joel's gesturing to when he's describing the results of studies of physicians' attitudes, that most people believe that if you are disabled, then your life is not one worth living that your life is one 
marked inherently by lack of dignity, by suffering, and by pain. And the reality, as we as disabled folks know, is that sometimes it does hurt to be disabled. And sometimes that pain is caused by other people's attitudes. Sometimes it's caused by violence. And sometimes it is caused by how our brains are actually functioning or how our bodies are actually functioning. But ableism teaches us to place a value judgment on those experiences. And ableism also teaches us to make assumptions about the inevitability of suffering with disability, to equate disability with suffering, and to equate disability with a state of existence that is so undesirable that many people will say, well, I'd rather be dead than disabled. It's a very common sentiment. I mean, you can ask anyone on the street what they are most afraid of about old age, about becoming elderly, and people will tell you that they are afraid of becoming incontinent. They're afraid of needing help dressing or bathing. They're afraid of developing dementia or Alzheimer's. They're afraid of needing a cane. These are all literally fears of disability. And so we've been taught as a society because of ableism that disability is something both to be pitied and to be feared. And in the same breath, we are taught to revive disability, right? Disability is this pathology. It needs to be fixed, hidden, or eliminated at all costs. So what does that tell us about how we treat disabled people in society? And I'll just add, building off of what Joel was just talking about, there was a study done within the last decade of physicians in the United Kingdom in which they found that doctors were more than three times as likely to make potentially dangerous and deadly, rapid, life or death decisions if they knew or believed that the patient they were treating had an intellectual disability than if they didn't. And Michael Stein, then I guess one of the real challenges with all of this is then what constitutes equal treatment? Because I know a lot of the way in which the Americans with Disabilities Act, you know, had been framed and the UN Convention has been framed is, is this is really a civil rights question this assurance that persons with disabilities are treated equally to all populations. What does equal treatment mean in legal terms? Well, it means a lot of things, Doug, and and it raises lots of issues. On its simplest level, you know, it's the question of why are women with disabilities kept from having mammograms or pap tests when they should be, or why are buildings inaccessible, healthcare facilities inaccessible to people with disabilities? Um, I mean, that's the simpler question. The deeper question is, how does ableism affect the creation of systems and institutions that inherently discriminate against people with disabilities under the patina of being neutral, empirically based, and fair? And we see that on things as as vague and abstract and economical as, you know, qualities, looking at the quality adjusted life years, which were the disability adjusted life years put together by the World Bank and the WHO in the 1990s without ever consulting people with disabilities and making assumptions about the quality of life and value of life of people with disabilities without any context um, or consultation and have as a result governed the allocation of public health resources, which are all done on a utilitarian, right, zero-sum game. We only have $6 billion to spend how we're going to do it. Notion that people with disabilities on average cost more than people without disabilities, which sometimes is true and sometimes is not, or that our lives are worth something like two-thirds, those of people without disabilities, which certainly is not true. We see it as well implicitly in things like the crisis standards of care, which were governing what should have been done during the COVID swells, where the easy answer to your question is, you know, the state of Alabama saying that people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities are not to be eligible, you know, for ventilator services. But then there's the harder to reach things, right, such as, well, we're going to allocate our care based upon who has longer life prospects following emergency care, something that is implicitly tied up in things like what are the uh, social dynamics and and impediments to health? Um, And by the way, don't we see an overlap here between race and disability and other social determinants of health? And by the way, isn't a physician's job to cure the person, get them out the hospital door, and not to think about whether they're going to live two years, 12 years, or whatever, i.e. don't play God. Um, So there are a lot of things that are more implicit and more stated underneath it. 
And these things affect physicians the way they approach their jobs because they're standards that are rendered as empirically neutral, of course, you know, economically valid, uh, when in fact they themselves incorporate and express biases. And PS, looking forward, we see many of the same things with AI. Um, not only do they incorporate bias and in putting together the information and the perspectives of people under the banner of neutral um, and scientific fact, but also create this loop whereby physicians and others in large healthcare data that have treated people with disabilities unfairly put in the results of those treatments and the data related to it as probative of why we ought to continue the same standards. And that creates a cycle of exclusion and, and discrimination. Um, so we see both the, the formal discrimination that's easier to rebut and the more implicit insidious discrimination, which is harder to root out. Lydia, since Michael Stein raised this, that certainly is a, a topic I'd love to wrestle with. So sort of following up on that, the ways in which technology, uh, these different technological advancements have had this impact on community, people with disabilities, the other examples, you know, other concerns that you would raise. Most people think about technology as simply being an equalizer for disabled people, right? That technology will enable more disabled people to do things. And generally, they're thinking about it as enable disabled people to do things more like abled people, right? To make disabled people seem like or move through the world more like non-disabled people. And in some ways, that's true, right? Like there are so many technologies that were originally invented with disabled people's needs in mind, like text messaging, for example, or curb cuts, which are not only enabling access for disabled people, but have also now become ubiquitous and incredibly useful and helpful to people who both are and are not disabled. And at the same time, technology also can pose particular harms for disabled people. My current work focuses on algorithmic injustices, that is the ways in which artificial intelligence and machine learning type software technologies can harm disabled people. And you know, just drawing off of the conversation we've been having so far, one thing that I learned with horror about last year during the beginning stages of the pandemic was that some hospitals were hoping to implement use of an algorithm to attempt to predict which patients would be more likely to recover from COVID as opposed to which patients might be more likely to succumb to COVID instead. And you know, that type of algorithmic prediction is already problematic to begin with, right? But we also know that it's going to be much more likely to assign penalties to disabled people who by definition are the ones that when we talk about people who are high risk from COVID or people with high risk conditions, what people are actually saying are disabled people without saying the word disabled. And we know just from observation, from anecdote, what's widely reported in the news, as well as the types of studies that Joel has done work on and that we've talked about in this conversation, that both the average person and the average medical professional tend to devalue the lives of disabled people. The disabled people have been denied treatment. The disabled people have been put at the bottom of lists for eligibility for COVID-related resources and care. The disabled people's lives are deemed not just not worth living, but not worth saving and not worth protecting. And so to hear hospitals talk about wanting to implement an algorithm to predict which patients would be most likely to survive COVID and thereby better prioritize or allocate their resources, human resources, actual devices like ventilators or PPE, actual time and attention, right? That's horrifying. Because we're here as members of the disabled community thinking, well, that sounds a lot like eugenics. Well, guess what? Eugenics never left. Eugenics never went away. We like to think it has because we associate it with the era of the Third Reich in Germany. But eugenics was an American export to the Nazi regime. And most people do not know that and are unwilling to reckon with that reality. And so... When I think about technological harms for disabled people, I'm thinking about how predictive policing tools literally further and exacerbate the crisis of mass criminalization and mass incarceration, targeting particularly black and brown disabled people for increased policing, increased surveillance, and increased incarceration. I'm thinking about the ways in which algorithmic decisions in our health and healthcare are destroying people's ability to access and receive both 
both acute illness-related care and ongoing lifelong long-term supports and services that people need to stay alive, to stay in their own communities. I'm thinking about the ways that algorithmic technologies are preventing people from successfully applying for rental housing, the ways in which algorithmic technologies are actually preventing people from being considered for jobs and in a capitalist society where our ability to work is directly tied to our ability to attain safe housing food shelter and health care that is literally a eugenicist policy right these are all eugenicist policies and eugenicist impacts that we think of technology as solely being beneficial or at worst simply being neutral or perhaps accidentally causing some unfortunate consequences but in reality our technologies do not exist outside or beyond systems of oppression that pervade every other aspect of society. They're created by people. Our technologies perpetuate and exacerbate and accelerate ableism, racism, and other structural inequity and injustice. And uh, Joe Michael Reynolds, I mean, that then highlights key to sort of huge challenges, the use of technology, and I think in particular, you're really talking about the rationing of healthcare and the cutting off of, you know, of healthcare for people with disabilities. That's a, a fundamental question about discrimination that's kind of built into the healthcare system. One of the unfortunate kind of historical quirks of, of bioethics and also, let's just say, the development of a kind of ethical sensibility in healthcare writ large in the global north. One of the quirks is that utilitarians came to prominence in the late 70s and 80s and have kind of held the reins by and large in a lot of these debates, both nationally and internationally. And uh, increasingly in the last decade, I would say that this is starting to change as people start to notice that among other things, many utilitarian logics actually run directly in conflict with human rights. There's certain things you don't get to just uh, quantify away when we establish that certain people have inalienable rights by virtue of being human. You know, I'm not going to go into the very annoying ethical debates over this. I'll just say that personally and professionally, I'm happy that more and more we're now seeing equity based arguments. We're seeing human rights based arguments as opposed to utilitarian or consequential arguments. I see this as a very, very crucial move. And I want to highlight something that uh, uh, Lydia just pointed to that I think is crucial for people to properly appreciate with the scale of the problem we're facing and how ableism is a driver and a core component of the social injustices and inequities we're seeing at a larger scale. And I'm just going to focus on the U.S. for a moment. I hope your listeners know we have the highest percentage of people incarcerated per capita of any country on earth. We spend more on our prison and jail system than any country per capita on earth. We have more police killings than any other industrialized wealthy nation on earth. And when you start to do more fine-grained analysis of this stuff, which is actually difficult to do because there's laws on the books that make it hard to do this research, you find out that on conservative estimates, somewhere around half of all people in our prison system are disabled in some sort or another relative to the definition of disability in the ADA. Both at, in least the half. At, least at least half. At least exactly. half, at right? Least. Like I've heard that it's up to 80%. Right, right. And the moment we start thinking about disability in as capacious a manner as we should, so intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, but also mental health conditions, I think you're right. It's, it's got to be closer to 80. Well, what's going on here? Well, if you take a wide historical lens, even let's just limit ourselves to 140 years, institutionalization has not gone anywhere. It's just now in our jail and prison system. The school to prison pipeline, the mental health crisis to prison pipeline, which differentially and far disproportionately impacts uh, black communities, Latinx communities, it impacts non-white communities far more than it does white communities. Though of course this gets complicated when we look at particular locations like Appalachia, et cetera. We institutionalize people. We throw them into a criminal system because we are not addressing the actual social needs and the fact that we have an utterly failed social net. We allow people to become homeless. You can't have a just society. You cannot pretend to have anything close to a just society if you allow people to become unhoused. And interestingly, even if you're a fiscal conservative, it's cheaper. <laughs> it has been proven over and over again. It's cheaper to never let that happen. And even just fixing our 
induced homeless crisis. This, the only reason we have this crisis is because of active political decision making to not address it. That cuts across uh, disability categories, that cuts across issues of marginalization relative to racialization, and it cuts across issues relating to gender, sexuality, uh, sex differences, all of this stuff. We have to fight and fix the roots of these problems. And the roots of these problems are more often than not, not simply in our healthcare systems, which certainly have problems of their own, they're in our society. That's where the problems are starting. So Lydia Brown, so far we've been talking, kind of framed a number of these issues around disability rights, but you've been highlighted some really interesting areas I'd like to delve into a little more detail about disability justice, about justice beyond just this question of disability rights. First of all, what's the difference in talking about disability rights versus disability justice and some examples where there's, there's a cleavage between the two? Disability rights understands that the way to change the social position and social conditions for disabled people is to advance changes to our laws and policies in furtherance of civil, human, and political rights. In other words, disability rights envisions the abolition or repeal of harmful laws, the passage of helpful laws and implementation of those laws, and the improvement and enforcement of existing laws and the laws that will come into being. And that that will take place at the local level as well as the national and the international level. And when I say that that involves political, civil and human rights, I mean that disability rights is thinking broadly spoken in terms of positive and and negative rights as articulated or recognized under law. It is thinking about the rights against discrimination, the rights against abuse, and the rights to education, the right to healthcare, for example, among many, many others. But disability justice, where it diverges, is it recognizes that while the work of disability rights and advancing civil, human, and political rights is necessary, it is still insufficient to actually challenge, let alone end, ableism. And I'll point to just two very clear examples of why that is the case. The Americans with Disabilities Act, which you mentioned in our introduction, was first passed into law more than three decades ago. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was also originally put into force in 2006. That's now 15 years ago, a decade and a half ago. And yet, both within the United States, where we currently are, and globally, Disabled people continue to be institutionalized. Disabled people continue to be abused by our family members, by our intimate partners, and by our caregivers. Disabled people in and outside the U.S. continue to to be denied equal access to education at all levels of education. Disabled people continue to face and experience homelessness at disproportionately high rates compared to non-disabled people. Disabled people continue to face medical, medical discrimination and sexual violence and literally every other form of violence and abuse individually or state sanctioned at a policy-wide or systemic level that we've always faced. The exact manifestations of those abuses have shifted with time and they are different from one cultural and national context to another. Where disabled people are not experiencing some form of ableism, if only because of the outgrowth of global imperialism and colonialism. And so disability justice recognizes that the problem of ableism is much more embedded into our society and culture than in our laws and policies. Our laws and policies simply reflect what our cultural and social values are. And when we do pass laws that have positive intended effects, that have excellent language to use for advocates and for policymakers, that doesn't necessarily mean that the spirit of that law comes into effect. Like I said, the ADA was passed more than 30 years ago. And yet here we are having this very conversation about ableism, right? So the ADA's passage, was that a victory? Sure, of course it was. I don't think anyone here would deny that. I don't think anyone would say that the ADA should not have been passed. But to say that disability rights alone is going to get us to the end of ableism is already disproven by the reality of our current situation. 
disability justice differs from disability rights in one other critical aspect, which is that disability rights has largely been a non-intersectional movement and framework. It is one that posits disability as existing primarily as its own independent category of difference. And that language in and of itself is problematic, right? And we can question that a little bit. And it posits that, that disability can be understood as separate and severable from other categories and sites of domination, of oppression, and of power. Disability justice recognizes that ableism is so intertwined with other forms of oppression, what we talked about earlier, that successfully challenging and ending it requires us to think about and to address directly the ways in which racism and white supremacy and patriarchy and class-based oppression and religion-based oppression, Christian supremacy, anyone, right? In which all these other forms of oppression also are outgrowths of and are feeders. Of. And if we aren't doing that, if we don't have that analysis, then the work that we're doing to address ableism isn't going to have any, any substantial or long-term effect. It's only going to be changing the superficial appearance of things rather than undermining and, and working to end the root of the problem. And so, uh, Michael Stein, what, what Lydia Brown just highlighted is currently the legal structure has only taken us so far. There's still obviously a lot of work that needs to be done I, on these questions. Do you perceive this is just a lack of sort of full implementation of the laws and in particular the legal structure we have in the way that we've tended to frame disability issues around the question of rights? Or do we need some kind of fundamental shifts in, in the legal structure and the legal language that's used to try to realize greater justice beyond advancement of rights? Lydia pointed out correctly that there is a difference between formal law and between changing the lived experience of the groups that you're hoping to affect. You know, we could also point to persons of color and women being empowered by Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Amendment, and things have improved even through formal implementation of those laws. Um, but the numbers and all the data and the lived experiences indicate that we haven't done enough. And that's why people are taking to the streets now to try to change that condition. So as the lawyer who teaches future lawyers and who writes laws and who implements laws, those are all valuable and I'm all for them because they set standards. But what we really need is social transformation. Um, and there are several reasons why we're seeing such a slow transformation here in this country that we could point to. Certainly implementation is one of them. We do have a very strong and terrific Department of Justice, um, but they're not doing some of the things that are very necessary to implement disability rights laws. They've never been allowed to go and do, uh, do statistical discrimination, which is something you need the juggernaut of the Department of Justice to do. They did it for people of color, they did it for women, they have been prohibited by every administration, Democratic or Republican, um, from doing that. They're not allowed to use testers and employment cases. There are many devices that they haven't done. So the implementation certainly, lack of implementation certainly hurt it. But on the other hand, you know, we could also point out that we were fortunate enough to get civil rights as a community of people with disabilities, and we're, we're glad that we have them, as, as Joel and, and Lydia pointed out. But um, you know, it was passed without huge monumental social shifts. We had a number of helpful protests in which people with disabilities took pride in their identity statuses and claimed their rights publicly. Um, but where was the march on Washington, D.C.? Where was the mall filled from side to side with people with all kinds of different disabilities claiming their rights? Where are, for example, the students that I teach across various parts of the university receiving accommodations and good for them and I completely support them. But where are they when it comes time to claiming their disability status? Where are they when it comes time to demanding that the university have disability studies? Where are they in protesting when the university does not include them in various diversity and other initiatives? So you need that social change, you need that social transformation in order to change society along with it. Um, laws do not change the hearts and the minds of, of those who are under those laws. Um, we need to change the attitudes. And disability is universal as a, as a phenomenon. 
It's also universal as the, being the recipient of stigma and prejudice. And so we're talking about millennia of deeply embedded prejudice. How do you change that? Passing a law is not gonna change that. Making people visible, making them understand their rights, encouraging people to claim their rights um, and, and to have pride in their, in their identities, that's part of it. Um, and both of, of my fellow panelists have pointed out extremely perfectly correctly um, that there's the issue as well of allyship. Right? Disability is not doing very well as a standalone identity category. If anything, it tends to isolate and cut off other groups, consciously, unconsciously, et cetera, who have vested interests and overlapping interests. Where is AARP, the largest lobbying group, one of the most powerful ones, when it comes to disability? Forever denying that there's an overlap in mobility and access to healthcare and identity and sexuality um, and so on and so forth. How about guardianship now? Right? So where's the, where's the AARP in doing this? Where are the women's groups in understanding that at least 50% of people with disabilities happen to be from whatever it is that we call the category of women and other gender amorphous categories? Where are the children's rights organizations? And now that we are in a post-COVID neoclassical world in which governments increasingly are shifting to the right and marginalized populations are left standing outside the door, sometimes sitting and crawling outside the door, we need that allyship to think about how to come together and argue for a we world instead of a me world, especially when the me is defined by ableist norms and tropes. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Doug Becker. We're discussing disability rights and disability justice. And Joel Michael Reynolds. Michael Stein just highlighted this question about COVID. I've been kind of wrestling with because we are all much more attuned to healthcare needs of communities as a result of COVID and thinking about, I mean, ultimately the kind of responsibilities we have for one another, for, for one another's health. Certainly there's been a backlash against some of that, you know, as well. Is there an opening here where our thoughts about COVID, the role of sort of the, our responsibility to one another for, for questions of health and for questions of equal treatment, that this could end up being a bit of a watershed moment as far as advancing uh, recognition of people with disabilities? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, it requires a, a two-part answer. The first one is the negative part and the second one will be the hopeful part. And the negative part is that, you know, COVID has taught us a lot of things that, you know, we should have known just from history. Go look at the 1918 flu epidemic, you would have already figured this out, that there's always a subset of the population that just either through misinformation, through caring more about themselves than others, is going to fight against the communal good. I'll limit myself to the US context. Maybe this is not true of all their countries in the world. I certainly hope not. Um, but they're going to put their perception of individual rights as above the common good. In a pluralistic society, you don't want to throw those people out. They're going to be there. That's fine. It's very depressing to me. I, I just can't. I mean, the mask thing is the most obvious. Like we have mountains, we have decades of research that if you have a respiratory virus like the COVID is, Everyone wearing a mask protects everyone very, very well. And the new people like, I'm not going to put on a mask. Like, it's just, it's depressing as hell that there are people who think this. Here's the opening. The majority of people care about the common good. The vast majority, way over 70%, let's say in the United States, depending upon what polling we're looking at. But what we're facing right now politically is a tyranny of the minority. We have Republican governors we have a Republican when the House and the Senate were controlled by Republicans who have done everything in their power to make sure that we do not actually have a representative democracy. Whether this is gerrymandering at the downstream, very local community level for like counties within states, or this is now the undermining of our Voting Rights Act and the failure of people like Senator Joe Manchin and Senator Kristen Sinema who are acting as though protecting voting rights in our country is a political football. This is a question of, are we actually a, going to try to be, we've never been a real democracy, are we going to try to be a real democracy and put what the majority actually wants at the forefront, which by the way, the majority wants universal health care, the majority wants serious substantive 
money put behind addressing climate change. The majority wants protections and equal rights for women and across gender categories. Like polling shows this over and over again, but we have a tyranny of the minority. And until we address the underlying injustice of our legislative system, that would include getting rid of the electoral college, by the way, but also like Montana shouldn't have the same representation in the Senate as like one seventh of California. Can't remember how the numbers work out. Puerto Rico should maybe perhaps have a representative. DC, where I live, you just under a million people who have zero representation. You know, it's like, it's a joke to act like what we are dealing with politically represents the majority. And if it did, if it did, I would have hope. If it did, I think we could address things like COVID and climate change in the future way better. We have to get rid of this tyranny of the minority that is distorting the promises of a democratic republic that presumably this country was built upon. And in keeping with this question about whether or not legislation is reflective of social norms, Michael Stein, I know that despite the fact that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities drew its inspiration and actually literally some of its language from the Americans with Disabilities Act, it has not been ratified by the United States. First of all, can you give a bit of an explanation as to why that is and what this means for the convention when a country with seemingly the value that should support the convention and even some legislation that would support it has not ratified it. Well, it was uh, an interesting dynamic to be an American at the United Nations and working on the negotiations for five years, knowing that your government first mildly opposed the idea of a convention and then remained silent on it and then muffled all the representatives from the United States and did not permit them to speak until the seventh ad hoc session. That was embarrassing and and painful to be sure. The U.S., of course, should ratify it. It would send a signal that the U.S. is in support of it. It would cost the U.S. nothing because the reservations, understandings, and declarations that the State Department under Obama attached to the treaty will do nothing that we don't have to do anyway under federal obligations. So it committed us to nothing. um, And it would have sent a very loud and and bright signal. Why have we not ratified it? Well, we could, we could go through the list and try to be fair in, in the analysis. Um, the idea that the US is exceptional, right? We are the only country in the entire world that has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child is true. Um, we are the only country along with Iran, which has not ratified the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So one of the few areas in which the U.S. and Iran can agree, which is the war on women and suppression of of our majority population. Um, So that's true. Um, On the other hand, we could point to numerous human rights treaties and numerous international laws that the U.S. has ratified, whether through Senate two thirds or whether through both houses of Congress with the majority of, of our legislators and point out that this was something different. We could try to take a bright spot and say that despite a lack of coordination and coherence in the disability rights community um, in pushing for the ratification, still 61 votes were there um, and point to that as somewhat of a victory. But at the end of the day, what we really have to point to is that disability has always been an across the aisle feature of American politics. Every single one of our civil rights statutes relating to people with disabilities, Architectural Barriers Act, which is the first one, right? Rehab Act, Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, later IDEA, ADA, ADA Amendments Act. Each one of these passed under a Republican presidency, each one of these passed with an overwhelming majority and, and overwhelming support by both houses of Congress. And here we went in the opposite direction and did not support disability rights. And if you look at it, I think we could see kind of uh, in in retrospect, the beginnings of this neoclassical Trump-based ableist politics that we have in our Congress, where where number one, we had untruths, stories, and alternative universes presented. 
much reminiscent of the ACA Obamacare, which would allegedly enable death panels, totally untrue. Much like here where they said that the UN would come and enter your home and see that you were homeschooling your child and would sanction you, totally untrue. Whether it's that the UN would come and take away your gun hidden in your cabinet um, because it endangered whatever it was that they said, totally untrue. Um, I think we're beginning to see that. And we saw the politics of fear with Rick Sanatorum lying left, right, and center about what the convention would do with the Cato Institute telling untruths about what the convention would do. It would require us to do nothing more than what is required under federal law. And that was what the reservations, understandings, and declarations said. So it's highly troubling that, that the rhetoric and the lies and the alternative universe is not alternative facts. They're not facts. They're fantasies, lies, and, and, and untruths. Um, it, it kind of foreshadows what would come afterwards. Um, and that is deeply troubling. As far as the rest of the world, you know, in a way we're kind of laughed at in that we claim in many ways, rightfully so, um, that we lead in disability rights um, and, and that we lead in disability norms for all our faults. And there are many, many gaps, many lost opportunities and many real screw ups and dysfunctions in our disability law and policy. Life as a person with a disability in this country is far better than life in most, the far majority of countries elsewhere. And yet we did not take the opportunity to, to take pride in our, in our disability rights and laws and take pride as a world leader. Um, that's a real lost opportunity. That one hurts. And uh, Lydia Brown, issues about persons with disabilities are, are of a particularly high profile these days. We see references to, to persons with disabilities, but certainly there's a long way to go as far as the recognition of disability rights, disability justice. I guess the last question kind of takes stock. Where are we going and how far do we need to go? I'm always thinking about, you know, what kind of future we actually want to have and not just about what the past is that we are hoping to eradicate. My thinking is informed greatly by that of abolitionist leaders. And one, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, has famously said that abolition is a project not of absence, but of presence. And I think of the work of disability justice very similarly. The work of disability justice is, to be sure, about eradicating ableism and also about eradicating attendantly other forms of oppression, right? Because we don't eradicate ableism if we are not also ending white supremacy and capitalism as Talila Lewis consistently reminds us. And so that is absolutely part of the work of disability justice. But the work of disability justice is just as much, if not more, about building the future that we want. Or as my friend Damian Patrick Williams always says, and is the title of his website, which I love, building a future worth thinking about. And I'm always thinking, what is that future? That future is one in which disabled people exist, in which we thrive, in which all people disabled or not have access, in which all people disabled or not are supported, are cared for, in which we all have absolutely without even a question about it as a baseline, safe food, safe housing, communities that we belong to, where we are welcomed in our communities, we are wanted in our communities, we are valued in our communities, we are able to live authentically and genuine lives according to what we understand about ourselves to be respected and honored in our individual dignity, and in which we are able to honor our collective obligations to one another. We are able to do and value care work what Leah Lakshmi Piepshina Samara Singha talks about, that we are able to value our interdependence as Mia Mingus and Kaite Davidson have always reminded us, that we are able to actually learn from and to apply the wisdom of disabled, crip, mad, and neurodivergent people's lives and leadership to teach us different ways of knowing and being and being in relationship are possible. Disability justice offers us both a pathway to ending the harms with which we currently contend and a vision for the future that we want to move toward. Last thought, and I, I've shared this in a lot of contexts, but I think 
frequently about the concept of tzedek, which is Hebrew for righteousness. But it also means justice, right? So it's this concept that both means righteousness and justice. So when I think about justice, disability justice, or social justice as this broader idea, I'm thinking about what does it mean for us to be in right relationship with one another? How can we get to a future where we are able to be in right relationship with one another and with the earth that we inhabit? And a wonderful statement on which to conclude that our panel has been Lydia X. Z. Brown. Lydia is on the core faculty of the Disability Studies Program at Georgetown University, and they are also on the faculty at the Critical Race and Gender Studies Program at American University. They are the co-editor of All the Weight of Our Dreams on Living Racialized Autism and the author of Ableist Shame and Disruptive Bodies, Survivorship at the Intersection of Queer, Trans, and Disabled Existence. Michael Ashley Stein is the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He's the editor of the book, Mental Health, Legal Capacity and Human Rights. And Joel Michael Reynolds, senior advisor to the Hastings Center and assistant professor of philosophy and disability studies at Georgetown University. He's the co-author of The Harm of Ableism, Medical Error and Epistemic Injustice, and the author of Three Things Clinicians Should Know About Disability. And again, a special acknowledgement for our producer, Melissa Chiprin, who produced today's show. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you to our guests and to you for listening. The Scholars Circle team includes Doug Becker, host, Ankine Arasian and Melissa Chiprin, managing producers. Sad Dongre, our webmaster. I'm Maria Armudian, and we'll see you next week.